So a new client has just put in a big order, but you want to make sure your agreement is ironclad. So you put together a contract. What are the key things that need to be in it? I'm Khalila Reynolds and it's time for another episode of Money Moves JA brought to you by Exim Bank's business advisory service, giving you the tools to grow your business. Today, I'm joined by attorney at law and dispute management practitioner, Dr. Chris Malcolm. And make sure you watch this video to the end because I have a giveaway coming up. Hi, Dr. Malcolm. It's great to finally have you on. It's been some time we've been trying to get you. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Kalila. And I'm happy to be on with you and with your viewers, wherever they may be in the world. So today we're talking about contracts, negotiating those contracts. And this can be a difficult one for especially somebody who is new to business. What are your tips for negotiating a contract? Oh, a contract, as you probably know, and as you lead, listen, as your viewers, wherever they are, should know if they haven't already known, is simply an agreement entered between or among parties, depending on the number of parties, that is capable of being enforced by a court of law. Now, where I look, the way I look at contract, in substance, it is simply a risk management tool. And in doing that, with that risk management approach, there are three letters that guide my approach to looking at contracts. And the letters are I, A, M. I am. And what that does for me is that it centralizes the focus for anybody, frankly. Because when you're thinking of it, if you think of it as a risk management tool, then what you firstly want to do is to try to identify the risks that you want to deal with. Mm. The next thing is to determine how to allocate those risks between the parties under the contractual arrangement. And the third thing you want to be able to do is to be able to manage or mediate those risks, whatever they may be. So in short, then, a contract is an arrangement where the parties will come together, understand what it is that they're hoping to achieve, then try to figure out what the inherent or other risks could be under that arrangement. And having then determined that, they find a way to allocate those risks between themselves. And that, of course, comes with pricing. And pricing can be by way of money or, or in some other way. And then what you want to do is to recognize that inherent in every contractual or other agreement is the possibility of disputes arising. So you want to minimize those disputes or to put proper arrangements in place to mediate them. So that is where the I am comes in. And so the primary tip then is to understand what you're about. Secondly, to understand how best to provide for what you intend to accomplish. And thirdly, to ensure that the parties by reference to what their ultimate intended outcome is, have an understanding of who is better or best able to deal with the risks that are associated with an arrangement, then you want to put a pricing mechanism in it. Because if I'm undertaking a risk, I should be paid for undertaking that risk, mm -hmm. right? And similarly, if I want to have a value, I should be prepared to pay for that value I wish to have. And then ultimately, you want to understand that however well conceptualized a contractual arrangement is, it is always possible that disputes are going to arise, and very often they do. So you want to ensure that you put a seamless system in place for dealing with those disputes if and when they arise. Mm -hmm. And that, if you get that core I am principle, which my approach is to contract right, then you can always take everything into that frame and, and work it out. So with that in mind, and you've set out an excellent foundation, what are the key elements that should be in my contract? Well, a contract, as I said, the first thing, and very often you hear a person speak about contract and in very ordinary legalistic language, you hear of a contract being required to have an offer, an acceptance, consideration, or a price to pay for it. And ultimately, there should be an intention to create legal relations, which is where the court and enforcement comes in. But my own approach is simply this, that if you take that all to the core, 
what you have is an offer which when made, it encapsulates everything upon acceptance. So the contract, when if I'm making an offer to you, for example, let's say you have a pen that I intend to buy or you intend to sell to me, put it the other way around. Then you will say to me, I, Kalila, would like to sell, and you don't have to call the names because we're dealing with each other, right? But you'll say, I, Kalila, have my pen to sell to you, Chris, and the price I wish to get for it is $30, right? So in that, you have the critical elements coming through. You already identify in that offer being made who the parties are. Kalila is vendor. Chris is intended purchaser, mm -hmm. right? You may describe the pen by reference to color, by reference to ink, and those are descriptive things you may enshrine around it. But you also go further. You also have included there the consideration or price, $30. And you also make it available to me for acceptance. But when I accept it, what do I do? I accept exactly what you offered to me. And that is why in contract, we speak of the acceptance being a mirror image of the offer that is made. And that is where we come about with the mirror image rule. Because if I don't accept exactly what you offer to me, we cannot have a contract. Why? Because a contract is about an agreement. And that is why in contract terms, we speak about this expression called consensus ad idem which is about a meeting of the minds. Because unless you have a meeting of the minds on the fundamental terms, you will not be able to get an agreement. And once you have got that, then what you will then do is have those things crystallize those terms, and those terms will establish what we call performance requirements. So the terms of the contract establish the performance obligations of the respective parties. And the ultimate objective, of course, is to once you set out those performance obligations, so let's say getting back to the price, you have told me $30, but you may go further to say, I am offering it to you for $30. You need to make a down payment by, the, by whatever date for a $15. And you need to pay the balance over time with $5 per month for a particular period until it is end. So you're now setting out the payment terms which now become your conditions in relation to the, to, to, the, to the contract that is being entered. But what happens though is that once that contract is, is entered, it sets out very clearly which party has an obligation to do what. And that is where it becomes a regulatory tool because you now have a clear indication of who is to do what and when. And you, by reference to those indications in the contract, will determine, for example, whether one party is failing to do what he or she is supposed to do. Hence, you come up with the concept of breach because mm -hmm. breach is simply a failure to perform as required under your contract. Mm -hmm. And of course, the ultimate intention is that the parties will do what they have all agreed or both agreed to do as the case may be. And at the end of it, you get a properly performed contract where everybody walks away being happy. Unfortunately, things do not always go that way very often somebody gets out of line. So I may have offered to pay you $30. And after I have paid you 25, you're trying to find me and you can't because I owe you $5. So you now may have to sue me for it. You may have to go through other processes to try to recover your $5 because you have already given me the pen. Okay, On so we'll come, to that, that I we'll come to that in the, in the next episode, Dr. Malcolm, Certainly. about how you, how you deal with that when the contract has been breached, how you resolve those disputes. But Indeed. let's recap what you've said so far. So we need the, the parties involved, the names yes. need to be on the contract. We need to have the amount, the agreed price. Yes. We need to have a description of the good or service being offered. Right? Which is a subject matter. Yes. Right, and the terms of the agreement. The terms are captured. All of those things, the party, who the parties are, is a term of the contract. What the price is, is a term of the contract. What the subject matter is, is a term of the contract. And all those fundamental... That was the word I meant to use. Conditions. The conditions, yes. Right. You do have the conditions for performance. And, and of course, you, you have, have to both sign it. Sign it. Well, no, that is, that is a misconception. A contract mm -hmm. is an agreement that, the, that is capable of being enforced. A contract does not have to be in writing. What is in writing is typically merely evidential of the contract, except there are special categories of contracts. For example, if you're selling land that require that the agreement be, be put in writing for enforcement purposes. And even with land, I hasten to add, 
you and I may have entered into an agreement for the sale of, let's say, Black Acre, wherever that piece of land is. And it may not have been in writing, but if there's sufficient information to support that we in fact had an agreement, passage of payment and so on, I can actually go to court if you're failing to give the path, turn over the land to me to get what I call, call specific performance. And that will, of course, be dealt with in the subsequent element of what we're doing. But the truth is, an agreement becomes a contract simply because you have all the requisite criteria being something which the court will recognize as demonstrating that there were established parties, established offer, established acceptance, established price to be paid, and ultimately, done in circumstances where the court finds that the parties were serious about it and that there was an intention to create legal relations. So what becomes important is to determine what create legal intention to create legal relations mean. And there's a very rough test for this. The rough test is that where the contract or the agreement has a commercial objective, price to be paid and those sorts of things, typically you treat it as giving rise to a contract. Where it is for social or domestic purposes, you and I decide to walk in the Kaya district somewhere. We have not entered into a, an agreement which the court will simply say, oh, you're just having friendly banter, you're just talking to each other. There was no intention when you decided to take a walk together that you wanted the court to interfere in this arrangement, right? So there is no absolute discretion, obligation to write. And in fact, what is important with a contract? is to recognize that even when you get it in writing, it typically is that writing is at the back end. It is after we have entered into an agreement that we get somebody to codify it by way of writing in any event, typically. Does this have to always be done by a lawyer when you, when you say get somebody to codify it or can I do it myself? Absolutely not. You can codify it, you can put it on anything, you can write it on the back of an envelope, you can do whatever. And the purpose of writing, and don't get me wrong, while I'm saying that an agreement does not have to be in writing, I am the first person to say you should always try to get it evidenced in writing. Why? Because if we have not put it in writing, it is always going to be your word against mine. And as I often try to say to persons, when it gets to that, it may be the person who is the better actor who is able to go to court and convince the court as to what really happened, right? Oh boy. <laughs> but if you have it in writing, it's easier to say, but here is the thing, you signed off on it. So it's easier to show what was agreed if it is in writing than if you're simply relying on what is called an oral agreement. So what then, if I were to encapsulate just one little bit, a contract may be wholly oral as in simply spoken. It may be wholly in writing or it may be evidenced partly orally and partly in writing. So those are the three ways in which you may be able to de demonstrate the existence of a contract. But whatever method you look at, it must always have the established position of who the parties are, what the subject matter was, who the, what the price was paid to be paid was, and what the, the, the in, and demonstrate that there was intention to create legal relations. Those are the four absolute requirements of every contract. I'm right here taking notes. Thank you so much. That was very useful, very helpful. Thanks, Dr. Malcolm. You're welcome. Here's a recap of Dr. Malcolm's key points on contracts. A contract is an agreement capable of being enforced by a court of law. Your contract should make clear the parties, the offer, acceptance, price, and an intention to create legal relations. Although a contract doesn't have to be in writing, you should always try to get it in writing. Time now for our giveaway question. What does the term consensus ad idem mean? Answer over on Exim Bank's Instagram page at Exim Bank JA and you can win a lovely prize. That's it for this episode of Money Moves JA, brought to you by Exim Bank's Business Advisory Service, giving you the tools to grow your business. Check out their website, EximBankJA.com. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Until next time.